Chapter Thirty of the Elusive Pimpernel by Baroness Orsi, read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage in March two thousand and eight. Chapter Thirty, The Procession. The grandfathers of the present generation of Boulonnais remembered the great day of the national fete when all Boulogne for twenty-four hours went crazy with joy. So many families had fathers, brothers, sons languishing in prison under some charge of treason, real or imaginary. So many had dear ones for whom already the guillotine loomed ahead, that the feast on this memorable day of September, 1793, was one of never-to-be-forgotten relief and thanksgiving. The weather all day had been exceptionally fine. After that glorious sunrise the sky had remained all day clad in its gorgeous mantle of blue, and the sun had continued to smile benignly on the many varied doings of this gay little seaport town. When it began to sink slowly towards the west, a few little fluffy clouds appeared on the horizon, and from a distance, although the sky remained clear and blue, the sea looked quite dark and slaty against the brilliance of the firmament. Gradually, as the splendour of the sunset gave place to the delicate purple and grey tints of evening, the little fluffy clouds merged themselves into denser masses, and these, too, soon became absorbed in the great billowy banks which the south-westerly wind was blowing seawards. By the time that the last grey streak of dusk vanished in the west, the whole sky looked heavy with clouds, and the evening set in, threatening and dark. But this by no means mitigated the anticipation of pleasure to come. On the contrary, the fast-gathering gloom was hailed with delight, since it would surely help to show off the coloured lights of the lanterns, and give additional value to the glow of the torches. Of a truth, t'was a motley throng which began to assemble on the Place de la seine et just as the old bell of the Beffroi told the hour of six. Men, women, and children in ragged finery, Pierrot with neck frills and flowered faces, hideous masks of impossible beasts roughly besmeared in crude colours. There were gaily coloured dominoes, blue, green, pink, and purple, harlequins combining all the colours of the rainbow in one tight-fitting garment, and columbines with short, tarlatan skirts, beneath which peeped bare feet and ankles. There were judges' perruques and soldiers' helmets of past generations, tall Normandy caps adorned with hundreds of streaming ribbons, and powdered headgear which recalled the glories of Versailles. Everything was torn and dirty. The dominoes were in rags, the pierrot frills, mostly made up of paper, already hung in strips over the wearer's shoulders. But what mattered that? The crowd pushed and jolted, shouted and laughed, the girls screamed as the men snatched a kiss here and there from willing or unwilling lips, or stole an arm round a gaily accoutred waist. The spirit of old King Carnival was in the evening air, a spirit just awakened from a long Rip Van Winkle-like sleep. In the centre of the place stood the guillotine, grim and gaunt, with long, thin arms stretched out towards the sky, the last glimmer of waning light striking the triangular knife there, where it was not rusty with stains of blood. For weeks now Madame Guillotine had been much occupied plying her gruesome trade. She now stood there in the gloom, passive and immovable, seeming to wait placidly for the end of this holiday, ready to begin her work again on the morrow. She towered above these merry-makers, hoisted up on the platform whereon many an innocent foot had trodden, the tattered basket beside her, into which many an innocent head had rolled. What cared they to-night for Madame Guillotine and the horrors of which she told? A crowd of Pierrot, with flowered faces and tattered neck-frills, had just swarmed up the wooden steps, shouting and laughing, chasing each other round and round on the platform, until one of them lost his footing and fell into the basket, covering himself with bran and staining his clothes with blood. Ah, vogue la galère! We must be merry to-night! And all these people, who for weeks past had been staring death and the guillotine in the face, had denounced each other with savage callousness in order to save themselves, or hidden for days in dark cellars to escape apprehension, now laughed and danced and shrieked with gladness in a sudden hysterical outburst of joy. Close beside the guillotine stood the triumphal car of the Goddess of Reason, the special feature of this great national fete. It was only a rough market-cart, painted by an unpractised hand with bright crimson paint, and adorned with huge clusters of autumn-tinted leaves, and the scarlet berries of mountain ash and rowan, culled from the town gardens or the countryside outside the city walls. In the cart the goddess reclined on a crimson-draped seat, she herself swathed in white, and wearing a gorgeous necklace around her neck. Desiree Candet, a little pale, a little apprehensive of all this noise, had obeyed the final dictates of her taskmaster. She had been the means of bringing the Scarlet Pimpernel to France and vengeance. She was to be honoured, therefore, above every other woman in France. 
She sat in the car, vaguely thinking over the events of the past few days, whilst watching the throng of rowdy merrymakers seething around her. She thought of the noble-hearted proud woman whom she had helped to bring from her beautiful English home to sorrow and humiliation in a dank French prison. She thought of the gallant English gentleman with his pleasant voice and courtly debonair manners. Chauvelin had roughly told her, only this morning, that both were now under arrest as English spies, and that their fate no longer concerned her. Later on, the governor of the city had come to tell her that citizen Chauvelin desired her to take part in the procession in the national fete, as the goddess of reason, and that the people of Boulogne were ready to welcome her as such. This had pleased Candé's vanity, and all day, whilst arranging the finery which she meant to wear for the occasion, she had ceased to think of England and of Lady Blakeney. But now, when she arrived on the Place de la seine chaussee and mounting her car found herself on a level with the platform of the guillotine, her memory flew back to England, to the lavish hospitality of Blakeney Manor, Marguerite's gentle voice, the pleasing grace of Sir Percy's manners, and she shuddered a little when that cruel glint of evening light caused the knife of the guillotine to glisten from out the gloom. But anon her reflections were suddenly interrupted by loud and prolonged shouts of joy. A whole throng of Pierrots had swarmed into the place from every side, carrying lighted torches and tall staves, on which were hung lanterns with many coloured lights. The procession was ready to start. A stentorian voice shouted out in resonant accents, A l'avant la grosse caisse! A man now, portly and gorgeous in scarlet and blue, detached himself from out the crowd. His head was hidden beneath the monstrous mask of a cardboard lion, roughly painted in brown and yellow, with crimson for the widely opened jaws, and the corners of the eyes, to make them seem ferocious and bloodshot. His coat was of bright crimson cloth, with cuts and slashings in it, through which bunches of bright blue paper were made to protrude, in imitation of the costume of medieval times. He had blue stockings on and bright scarlet slippers, and behind him floated a large strip of scarlet flannel, on which moons and suns and stars of gold had been showered in plenty. Upon his portly figure in front he was supporting the big drum which was securely strapped around his shoulders with tarred cordages, the spoil of some fishing vessel. There was a merciful slit in the jaw of the cardboard lion, through which the portly drummer puffed and spluttered as he shouted lustily, En avant! and wielding the heavy drumstick with a powerful arm, he brought it crashing down against the side of the mighty instrument. Hurrah! Hurrah! En avant les trompettes! A fanfare of brass instruments followed, lustily blown by twelve young men in motley coats of green, and tall peaked hats adorned with feathers. The drummer had begun to march, closely followed by the trumpeters. Behind them a bevy of columbines in many-coloured tarlatan skirts, and hair flying wildly in the breeze, giggling, pushing, exchanging ribald jokes with the men behind, and getting kissed or slapped for their pains. Then the triumphal car of the goddess, with Demoiselle Candet standing upright in it, a tall gold wand in one hand, the other resting in a mass of scarlet berries. All round the car, helter-skelter, tumbling, pushing, came Pierrot and Pierret carrying lanterns, and harlequins bearing the torches. And after the car, the long line of more sober folk, the older fishermen, the women in caps and many-hued skirts, the serious town-folk who had scorned the travesty, yet would not be left out of the procession. They all began to march to the tune of those noisy brass trumpets which were thundering forth snatches from the newly composed Marseillaise. Above, the sky became more heavy with clouds. Anon a few drops of rain began to fall, making the torches sizzle and splutter, and scatter grease and tar around, and wetting the lightly covered shoulders of tarlatan-clad columbines. But no one cared. The glow of so much merry-making kept the blood warm and the skin dry. The flower all came off the Pierrot's faces, the blue paper slashings of the drummer-in-chief hung in pulpy lumps against his gorgeous scarlet cloak. The trumpeter's feathers became streaky and bedraggled. But in the name of that good God who had ceased to exist, who in the world or out of it cared if it rained or thundered and stormed? This was a national holiday, for an English spy was captured, and all the natives of Boulogne were free from the guillotine to-night. The revellers were making the circuit of the town, with lanterns fluttering in the wind, and flickering torches held up aloft, illumining laughing faces red with the glow of a drunken joy, young faces that only enjoyed the moment's pleasure, serious ones that withheld a frown at thought of the morrow. The fitful light played on the grotesque masks of beasts and reptiles, on the diamond necklace of a very earthly goddess, on God's glorious spoils from gardens and countryside, on smothered anxiety and repressed cruelty. The crowd had turned its back on the guillotine, and the trumpets now changed the inspiring tune of the Marseillaise to the ribald vulgarity of the Saïra. 
Everyone yelled and shouted. Girls with flowing hair produced broomsticks, and astride on these, broke from the ranks and danced a mad and obscene sarabande, a dance of witches in the weird glow of sizzling torches, to the accompaniment of raucous laughter and of coarse jokes. Thus the procession passed on, a sight to gladden the eyes of those who had desired to smother all thought of the infinite, of eternity and of God in the minds of those to whom they had nothing to offer in return. A threat of death yesterday, misery, starvation, and squalor, all the hideousness of a destroying anarchy that had nothing to give save a national fate, a tinsel goddess, some shallow laughter and momentary intoxication, a travesty of clothes and of religion, and a dance on the ashes of the past. And there along the ramparts, where the massive walls of the city encircled the frowning prisons of Gaillol and the old chateau, dark groups were crouching, huddled together in compact masses, which in the gloom seemed to vibrate with fear. Like hunted quarry seeking for shelter, sombre figures flattened themselves in the angles of the dank walls, as the noisy carousers drew nigh. Then, as the torches and lanterns detached themselves from out the evening shadows, hand would clutch hand and hearts would beat with agonized suspense, whilst the dark and shapeless forms would try to appear smaller, flatter, less noticeable than before. And when the crowd had passed noisily along, leaving behind it a trail of torn finery, of glittering tinsel and of scarlet berries, when the boom of the big drum and the grating noise of the brass trumpets had somewhat died away, wan faces, pale with anxiety, would peer from out the darkness, and nervous hands would grasp with trembling fingers the small bundles of poor belongings tied up hastily in view of flight. At seven o'clock, so it was said, the cannon would boom from the old Beffroi. The guard would throw open the prison gates, and those who had something or somebody to hide, and those who had a great deal to fear, would be free to go whithersoever they chose. And mothers, sisters, sweethearts, stood watching by the gates, for loved ones to-night would be set free, all along of the capture of that English spy, the Scarlet Pimpernel. End of chapter 30